Hello everyone and <clears throat> welcome back to Lifehouse Online. So glad that you've taken the time to check out this video uh, today to be in the Word together uh, today. As we jump back into our series, uh, just simply entitled Set Apart, it's kind of a look into the nature of the church or ecclesiology as, as the fancy name is for it. And so I'm excited to get back into it and a lot more to talk about today, just kind of where we're going over the next several weeks. We have just been informed this week that the uh, stay at home order is going to continue. And uh, so it looks like we're going to be online for a few more weeks, at least, um, well, today and then two more. Uh, but then again, just to want to reaffirm, right, we're just trusting God in all of this and so thankful for what we have and what we've been given and the opportunity to still worship him and to... Um, and he'll still be his witness in the world today, which is what we're going to be talking about. So before we get into that, let's just uh, uh, pray and ask God to lead us and guide us. Heavenly Father, thanks so much for today. Thank you for uh, your goodness to us, Lord. Oh, you are holy and righteous and loving, compassionate. That God, that you are close to the brokenhearted that you dwell amongst the praises of your people. My God, there is no one else to turn to but you. And we are your children and we're so thankful for that. Thank you for your word and um, that God that you provided the technology to, to for us to, at least in some way, kind of sit and, and be under that um, together. So teach us as we get, dig into your word. God, convict us today where we need to be convicted. Um, we thank you for your Holy Spirit who dwells within us, who gently convicts and empowers and leads and loves and gives us the assurance of our forgiveness today. So Lord, thank you for that. I don't know where we would be without all that you've done in the gospel of grace. And so uh, we just look forward to what you have for us today, Lord. We just ask your blessing on this video, on this time, and this message, and pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So just a quick review of where we are in this series. We've talked about being the church and that we have been set apart by God and bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us on the cross, that's saving us and and together uniting us as a body. And so we gather as his body. We talked about that. We spent three weeks looking at what the gathering actually means. And so we gather as his body to worship Jesus Christ as Lord and, and King. And as a result of that, we ourselves are built up by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the, the uniqueness of the church is that we are created by God. We are built up by Jesus we are empowered and edified by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so literally, the body of Christ, that is the church, has the power of the Holy Trinity coursing through its veins. It is unlike anything else. The world cannot duplicate or imitate the church. We talked about gathering physically and in, in that we do so to worship Jesus and, and to be built up and that... We fix our eyes on him right from the beginning of our service, at the beginning of our gathering. We confess our sin together and we stand in the in affirmation of the assurance of the fact that we are forgiven by that precious blood of Jesus. We sing praises about that and how that builds us up as well. We celebrate the Lord's Supper together and then together we sit under the preaching of his word. So our gathering has that substance of both uh, um, giving and receiving. And what we've tried to do at Lifehouse is by its very structure, we put the gospel on display. As Jesus says, to come all who are weary and tired and carrying many, many heavy weights of just trying to find uh, a right way of living to be accepted by God. But just come and, 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 and take on my yoke, Jesus says. Take me on and let's do this together. Let me be the one that forgives all of your sin and reconciles you that, to the Father because there is no other way. He is the only way. So we do that together as a church and, and, and even by, by coming together with that in the forefront of our minds and at the forefront of our service, we do put the gospel on display. But what about the Christian life outside of the gathering? What we've started to do at LifeHouse 
uh, several months ago, right after the second lockdown, was to end our service in what's called a benediction. And that may be a very familiar word to a lot of you uh, who have been growing up in the church for a long time. It's this portion of the service where the pastor or, or anyone for that matter could stand up at the end of the service and give a blessing as you go. That's what it's designed to do. But it's not just a blessing. It's, it's also a commissioning to go out into the world and and to do a couple, and to, to do many things, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But just as an example of a commissioning, of a benediction in Revelation one verses five and six, John says to the one, to sorry, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. It's an example of a benediction, a commissioning, right? There's in there, this is who you are, and now you are sent out to serve God and the Father. So to glory and to him be power forever and ever. Amen. And we aren't the only ones that commission. Jesus himself commissioned. And a lot of us know the Great Commission. If you don't know what is uh, often called the Great Commission is Matthew 28 verses 18 to 20, where Jesus says to the 11 who were with him, go and tell. Really, he says, he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But the commissioning isn't just to go and tell. It's not just going and doing, but it's also going and being. So listen, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 to 17, Paul says this, he says, But thanks be to God, who always leads us in Christ's triumphal procession, and through us spreads the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For to God, we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To some, we are an aroma of death leading to death, but to others, an aroma of life leading to life. So yes, a commissioning by Jesus and here by seeing by Paul is both a go and tell, but also a go and smell. Now, I'll pause right now so you can all roll your eyes or laugh hysterically. Okay, go ahead and do that. Go and tell and go and smell. But like, isn't that what he's saying? Jesus says, go into all the world and tell them the gospel. Make disciples and teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. Baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And yes, that's a doing. That is a go and do this. And Paul says, well, Paul says, as well as that, go and be. Be the fragrance of Christ it's, that spreads the aroma of knowledge of him in every place. So literally it is go and tell and go and smell. So if you're rolling your eyes, listen to me. You're doing it to the Bible. No, I'm just kidding. Anyways, it's important to understand that our witness in the world, when we scatter as the church, is not only the mission to go and preach the gospel, but is also to go and live out who we are. Children of God in our conduct in the world will reflect that. It will reflect that. So the question really what we're after is how. If we're set apart to scat to, to gather, yes, now we're set apart to scatter. Well, what does that mean? How does that look? How does the Christian life as the church is sent out into the world, what does it look like when we scatter? Or more precisely, uh, the question I asked a group of, of, of NCC students this week when I was spending time with some of the dorm students uh, is literally this, what does it mean to follow Jesus in the world when we're scattered? What is it that we do? And so I want to be predominantly working out of Matthew chapter 10. And uh, I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's, it's, I say that like that because it is kind of lengthy. Um, and we will see parallels of this story both in uh, Mark chapter 6 uh, in Luke chapter 9, uh, but and as well in Luke chapter 10, we'll see as, as Jesus sends out the 72, but they're they're very close and very similar, and the instructions are, are pretty much the same. So we're going to predominantly be in Matthew chapter 10, which gives us an exhaustive look at the instructions that Jesus gives to the 12. 
And I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible, and I keep forgetting to mention this. I know we all have different translations, but just so you know, the translation that I use is, is called the, the Christian Standard Bible. I found it to be a, a, a word for word that makes it uh, understandable. And, uh, and, so, and so here we go. So Matthew chapter 10. Summoning his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Jesus sent out these 12 after giving them instructions. Don't take the road that leads to the Gentiles and don't enter any Samaritan town. Instead, go to the lost sheep, the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick and raise the dead. Cleanse those with leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you received, freely give. Don't acquire gold, silver, or copper for your money belts. Don't take a traveling bag for the road or an extra shirt, sandals, or a staff for the worker is worthy of his food. When you enter any town or village, find out who is worthy and stay there until you leave. Greet a household when you enter it, and if the household is worthy, let your peace be on it. But if it is unworthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone does not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Look, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, because they will hand you over to local courts and flog you in their synagogues. You will, be, you will even be brought before governors and kings because of me to bear witness to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, don't worry about how or what you are to speak, for you will be given what to say at that hour, because it isn't isn't you, but the spirit of the father, that the spirit of your father is speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death and a father, his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to another. For truly, I tell you, you will not have gone through the towns of Israel before the son of man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher or a slave above his master. It is not enough for a disciple to become like his teacher and a slave like his master. For if they called the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? Therefore, don't be afraid of them, since there is nothing covered that won't be uncovered and nothing hidden that won't be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. What, I, what you hear in a whisper, proclaim on the housetops. Don't fear those who kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's consent. But even the hairs of your head have been counted. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Therefore... Everyone who will acknowledge me before others, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. Don't assume that I have came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to turn a, father, a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against her daughter-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. The one who loves a father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The one who loves a daughter or son more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Anyone who finds his life will lose it. And anyone who loses his life because of me will find it. The one who welcomes you welcomes me. And the one who welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. Anyone who welcomes a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and anyone who welcomes a righteous person because he is righteous will receive a righteous person's reward. And anyone who gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is a disciple, truly, I tell you, he will never lose his reward. Now I want to read 
Matthew 11, just the first verse says this, when Jesus had finished giving his instructions to his 12 disciples, he moved on from there to preach and teach in their towns. That was all the instructions by Jesus, and may God bless the reading of his word today. The context to which we are reading is, if you can imagine, and I know we can, is to, to be in the huddle with Jesus and his disciples. So he summoned them together, and he's basically, yes, giving them all of that instructions. And really, that's what I imagine is Jesus really calling, saying, hey guys, let's huddle up. And so if we can imagine, and listen, I would even say if you're not a Christian and you're just checking out this video, you're just checking out this passage and, and listening in, I want you to see all that it means to be a follower of Christ. And so we, you can peer into the huddle as well. Okay, so Jesus says and does many things in the Gospels before the cross and before the resurrection that are fully comprehensible only after these events. In other words, the instructions he gives to the, to the 12 here don't just apply to what's about to happen in their lives, but also applies to things that are going to come after Jesus has left the earth and the Holy Spirit has come. So he's not just saying things that are immediate, but also future tense. And it's significant in two ways, that his disciples are being sent out into this present world, but also to what lies ahead after he leaves, but then that also means that this not only speaks to the 12 disciples, it also speaks to us at Lifehouse. So why did I choose this passage? Really, why did I choose Matthew 10 to be the central focus, not just for today, but for the next several weeks? Why didn't I choose one of Paul's letters that, that really gives insight into Christian living as well? Right? It also speaks to the church that is scattered out in the world. And so let me ask you this. When you heard the words of Matthew 10... If you are reading right along with it, if you've ever read it before, hearing these instructions that Jesus gives to his disciples, did you ever think, um, yeah, I'm not interested? <laughs> like, really, when you looked at, at all of that Jesus just said, when we look, go through all of the things, like Jesus said, you're going to go out into the world, guys, and I want you to take nothing with you. Like, just take the clothes that are on your back. The, the walking stick that you have right now, I know you got an extra one at home. Yeah, but don't go home and get that. Just go with what you have. I want you to go and talk to your friends. I want you to go to talk to strangers about me. He said, not to the Gentiles or the Samaritans. He said, go to the house of Israel, meaning this. Just so that we understand properly the context, but also the context, I think it flows into what we have as well, is that Jesus is saying, listen, you don't need to go east to the Gentiles. You don't need to go north to the Gentiles and you don't need to go south to the Samaritans. Actually, don't do those things. Stay in your home community. Stay right where you are and go out and preach the kingdom there. It actually, you notice he doesn't say, you know, go west because if you go west, you're going to end up in the Mediterranean Sea, but stay here. Stay home. The Sea of Galilee, right where they were, is where most of these guys grew up. This was their home. This was the place Jesus was and he went around and called them to follow him so they're in the midst of their family and friends, and yes, they're complete strangers, but, but these are the people Jesus is calling them to go to. And to understand that, listen, guys, both now and in the future, Jesus says, you're going to face persecution. Yeah, from your friends. Yes, from strangers. Yes, from governing authorities, all because of me. All because you bear my name. Maybe it was... If you thought, yeah, I'm not interested, or maybe I'm not too sure about this whole Christian thing or following Jesus thing, maybe it was verse 21 and 22 that might have done it. And I just want to repeat it again because I think it's a very verse that we've got to take note, a very great verse that we've got to take notice of. That Jesus says, "Brother will betray brother to death, and his a father his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of my name." And it might be, if you're peering into this huddle, hearing the instructions of Jesus, that might be the thought in your head is that, listen, if this is the result of me living as a Christian scattered out into the world, then I'm out. I'm, I'm, no way. If this is, the, if this is what's going to happen, yeah, you can count me out. But notice, none of the 12 did that. None of the 12 said, I'm out. None of them did because Jesus is worth it. 
It's because Jesus is worth it, serving him, scattered in the world, and all that he says that comes with it, friends, is worth it. Is worth it. We obey what we love and what we love and what we recognize as loving authority. So it's not just, it's not that because Jesus loves me that I'll go out and do all of that he's telling me to do. I'm going out there because he's a loving authority. He is the King of Kings. All authority has been given to Jesus Christ. He is the, the King of Kings and he is the Lord of Lords. So because of that reason, and because he is the authority that loves me, cares for me, saves me, reconciles me, and restores me and redeems me, that's why I'm going to go out. All of that he is worthy of. So I trust him. So what I want to do over the next five weeks, five weeks, um, I, I, I'm in this group of uh, uh, pastors, this cohort, where we're kind of encouraged you guys, and I've told you guys about this before. And so we're talking about preaching, and uh, the guys were like, well, how much do you prepare um, series-wise? Some guys prepare their whole year. They've got every week allotted. I'm not one of those guys. So this series wasn't meant to be this long, but just even this week working through this passage and, and really following God's leading in this. And to be honest, this is easier done online. We can break things up. Videos don't need to be 40 minutes or anything like that. We can make them 15 or 20. So I'd like to think, and I've got written here right in my notes, there will be five shorter sermons over the next five weeks. But you know me. It may be shorter. It may not. But, uh, but I want to do it intentionally because what we're going to look at is the five D's, the five D's of what it means to follow Christ, to be scattered in the world as the church. And uh, I want to do so intentionally, not just to, to, as me telling you so that you know, and that you can, uh, there will be, you know, such practical uh, use of every single step, but also that it can be something that you can do, but you could also look at somebody else and say, I can do this with you. So that if you ever think, what does it mean to disciple somebody else, this would be a guide for you. In your own discipleship, growing in your own faith, following Christ in the world, but also that you could grab one other person and say, here, you're going to do this with me. This is what it means to follow Christ in the world. And it's going to be five Ds. And of course, they all start with the same letter. Of course, it's going to be like this cheesy. But you know what? You know me. That's the way it goes. And so I'm hoping, though, that when doing this, it sticks and uh, uh, um, it's easier. So it, it, in saying all of that, what I want to do eventually uh, when all of this is over and we can get back to meeting more regularly is do something called Lifehouse Labs. We have what's called the five G's of evangelism or the five G's of the gospel and then how we share that with our community. So that would be one lab and then another lab, the five D's of discipleship of, of what does it mean to be a follower of Christ in the world. So eventually, that's what we're going to get to. We're going to do it together, both as a church, both with the students on campus. All of that is, is part of the vision of, of, of where I'm, I want to go with this and uh, looking forward to that. But right now, we've got online, and so we praise God for what we've got. So the five Ds, I'm not going to give them to you all right now, but the first is foundational, and it's called direction. The first of the five Ds, foundational to the rest of the... The rest of this course is direction, direction. So write that down, direction, meaning that we walk this life in Jesus's direction. Eyes focused on him and under his instruction, okay? Eyes focused on Christ, where he leads we go. That's what it means to walk in his direction, so in the context of Matthew 10, in referencing this for the next five weeks, as well as other verses too as well, Jesus summons his 12 disciples, the King of Kings, Jesus, the Lord of Lords. He summons 12 ordinary men, 12 ordinary men, but that's important. That's important. In our home, um, we scatter in our home. <laughs> in, in other words, we have teenagers here, and so uh, they spend a lot of times in their rooms. And so at supper time, there's a summoning that happens. We eat every single supper together as a family. And, uh, and so around dinner time, either Julie or I will send a text out to the family with summons. And it's just one word, supper 
with an exclamation point. And they all come. And they all come because they're my family. They're my children. They come when they're called. Well, most of the time. Yes, they come when they're called. Why? Because that is what family does. Jesus says in Matthew 10, my sheep hear my voice. Summoning the 12 disciples, my sheep hear my voice and I follow them. Sorry. And uh, I know them and they follow me. I give them an eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father has given them to me. He is greater than all. No one is able to, st to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. So Jesus calls them, summons them, and they come. Why? Because they are his. And he sends his out, gives them instructions. He scatters, he scatters them into the world, into their community. Giving, giving them instructions. And what I want us to understand as we walk through this and understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus in the world, the church that is now scattered after we've gathered, is, is that we never put what we do before who we are. And I noticed that that's right at the front of Matthew 10. He summons his disciples. He summons those who are his. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. It is not, it is not identity versus action. It is not um, who you are versus what you do. As a matter of fact, it's, it's even by Matthew 10, it's, it's telling us that it's identity before action. What, what you do has not replaced who you are. What you do has not replaced who you are. That's important to understand because missiology has not replaced ecclesiology. Missiology meaning what is the mission of the church, the mission that Christ has given us to go into all the world and make disciples. That has not replaced who we are. We've been set apart by God to worship Jesus together, both when we gather and both when we scatter. But we're his. We are his children the Holy Spirit dwells within us, edifies us, empowers us, and glorifies the Father through his Son. And one of the things that we do is to go into the world and make disciples. But missiology has not replaced ecclesiology. What you do has not replaced who you are. It's significant because in, in Jesus' instructions to his, his 12 disciples, he inserts this passage. Listen, aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without, listen, your father's consent. Didn't say the father's consent. Jesus says, not one of them falls to the ground without your father's consent. I have no idea what a sparrow was worth, really. But he says, aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? It sounds like he's implying that it's pretty cheap, pretty inexpensive. That, that, that even that people would have this kind of context of, of looking at sparrows like they're next to nothing. And yet... Not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's consent. He cares about the sparrow. But even the hairs of your head have been counted. So don't be afraid, for you are worth more than sparrows. What you do has not replaced who you are. You are loved more than many sparrows. And in the next first, sorry, in the first 16 verses, kind of looking at that today, we see that what is at the foundation of being a Christian that is scattered in this world, the church that has been scattered to go and tell and go and smell, and that the world that we live in is this, it is direction. It is direction. And direction, as we are focused on Christ and under his instruction, is made up of two things. So here's an equation I want you to write down. Direction equals devotion plus dependence. Direction, that is to keep our eyes focused on Christ and to live in his instruction, comes from the combination of our devotion to him and our dependence on the Holy Spirit. It's devotion and dependence. This is integral. It is foundational to the Christian life to be the church scattered in the world. Devotion plus dependence equals direction. Devotion. What does it look like to be devoted to Christ, according to Matthew 10? To acknowledge Jesus, that is therefore anyone who will acknowledge me before others, I will also acknowledge him before our Father in heaven. Devotion looks like loving Christ, loving Jesus the most, 
The one who loves a father or mother more than me, Jesus said, is not worthy of me. The one who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So it's acknowledging Jesus and loving Jesus and then living a life of sacrifice because of those two things. Because of your devotion to Jesus comes with it sacrifice. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Anyone who finds his life will lose it. And anyone who loses his life because of me will find it. And these 12 apostles, these 12 guys are there and they are acknowledging Christ and they are loving Christ and about to be sent out and, and put that to the test of a sacrificial life. They are his sent ones to send out a message. They are devoted to Jesus. And here's the message they've been given to go out with. As you go, guys, proclaim the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy, and drive out demons. Freely you received, freely give. This is the same message that Jesus says as he's going from town to town in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. He says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The good news is the gospel of grace. And I'm intentionally using that word grace and tying it to the gospel because there's nothing we've done nothing we've we've done to earn or merit or be worthy of the saving grace of jesus christ our forgiveness is not because of anything we've done these 12 guys in this huddle there's nothing one of them has done up until this point where jesus is like you qualify you have done such a righteous job at living life hey that's why i'm sending you out no they've been saved purely by the grace of god and they've placed their faith and trust in Jesus. So that is the gospel of grace that they have freely received as Jesus. Just walking up to Matthew's tax booth and saying, follow me. That's an act of grace. That's an act of grace. Matthew was a, he was a cheat. He was a liar. He was ripping off his own people. And yet Jesus walks up and says, follow me. And his life is completely changed. His life is complete. That's the gospel of grace. It changes us radically. And so freely you guys have received and therefore so go and freely give that message, that gospel of grace that the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus is near. Grace is near. The gospel is near. And along with that, the disciples were given the authority from Jesus to perform many miracles that would authenticate their message. Okay, so go and uh, heal the sick and raise the dead and cleanse those with leprosy and drive out demons. Now, we would pray to do all of those same things. We would pray to do all of those same, same things. But in this context, this message was given many signs and miracles to authenticate the message. But that does not leave them void of meaning. Meaning like, just go heal people and then people will believe what you say. Okay, that's not what I'm trying to get at whatsoever. And nor is that what Jesus is saying. Because the gospel of grace is a gospel that heals. It is a gospel that has compassion. It is a gospel that loves, and it is a gospel that has power to drive out demons. When I think of devotion, and I know this message is probably gonna be a lot longer than a shorter message, but that's okay. When I think of devotion, uh, I had to read uh, a biography when I was in uh, Bible college by Richard, Richard, Richard Wormbrand. Not easy to say. Um, anyways, in, in 1948, he had uh, become a Christian about 10 years earlier than that. And he came out publicly and said communism and Christianity were not compatible. And as a result, he experienced imprisonment and torture um, by then the communist regime of Romania because of what he believed and because of what he said. He spent a total of 14 years in prison and was tortured in, for what he believed and confessed to believe. He was a man that was devoted to Jesus Christ. So he, he, his confession of faith in the public square was also his continued confession of faith while he was in prison and tortured. But he said this, it's almost funny, it's almost comical. He says, it was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners. It was understood that whoever was caught doing this received a severe beating. A number of us decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching. So we accepted the communists terms. It was a really great deal. We preached, they beat us. We were happy preaching. They were happy, be happy beating us, so everybody was happy. 
And so he turns around and then he, he, he challenges us today. He challenges the church by saying, listen, are you seeking Jesus? So here's a man that sought after Christ and was devoted to him. He was walking in his direction. And he send, and turns and says to, to us, are you seeking Jesus? Where have you been looking for him? As you begin your day, think through the various places you will be and the people that you will be with and envis envision Jesus standing next to you in these places. This is a man who was devoted to Jesus. And perhaps, perhaps we look at men like this and women who are doing the exact same thing and, and serving God in remote places of the world under persecution daily and under, in hiding perhaps, because of persecution. And we look at them and say, wow, to be devoted to Jesus, that's what it looks like. But how many of you know who Thaddeus is? Now, even in saying that, even in saying that, um, maybe you're going, Thaddeus, where did I hear that? Where did I just hear? Okay, so he's one of the 12. He's one of the 12. If you go right back to the, the beginning of Matthew chapter 10, you'll see his name there. Well, what, he's, what has he done? What did he ever do? Listen, nobody knows. We don't know. But what we do know is that he was summoned by Jesus. Meaning you may not be an overseas missionary, risking your life for sharing the gospel in a hostile country. You may not be an, the, an author writing the next Christian bestseller. You may not be the pastor of a large church or a small one for that matter. You may not be somebody who is doing something for God that is so public that the community at large can't help but take notice. But friends, listen, you have been summoned by Jesus. And that matters. That matters more than anything else. And so be devoted to him. Direction equals devotion plus dependence. There is devotion to Jesus Christ and dependence on the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus has challenged them, but then reminded them the exact same time. He says, along with the freely giving the gospel of grace, Jesus said to them, don't acquire gold, silver, or copper for your money belts. Don't take a traveling bag for the road or an extra shirt or sandals or a staff. Right, what we said, just take what you have with you right now for the worker is worthy of his food. See, the disciples needed to learn a principle that you and I need to learn as well, is that we are not to pursue luxury while learning to rely on God's providence. It's learning this life of, of Christ in the world, of being a Christian, of being a ch church that's scattered into the world is we're, one of the lessons we got to learn is, is to depend on God's providence. That's an important lesson for us to learn and not to pursue luxury. That could be the greatest challenge today for a lot of us. And, but Jesus says, like, I'm going to provide for you. And it's interesting. So Matthew 10, which I talked about a little bit earlier, Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them in also, and they will listen to my voice. So you're going to go out and you're going to preach the gospel of grace that the kingdom has come near, that reconciliation with God the Father is possible through the Son. That's the message we take. And then along the way, I'm going to provide for you through my people who you're going to reach with the gospel of grace. As you preach this message, my Holy Spirit will touch their hearts and they will provide for your needs. Man, how cool is that? How cool is that? How God works like that. And so he says, listen, when they hand you over, when that persecution comes, don't worry. <laughs> Weird words. Like, don't worry as you're facing trial, literally. Don't worry about how or what you are to speak, for you will be given what to say at that hour. Because listen, it isn't you speaking, but the Father but sorry, but the spirit of the father is speaking through you. Your needs are going to be taken care of by the Holy Spirit. Depend on him. The words you say are going to be provided for you. So depend on him. These are absolutely foundational to understand what it means to be a follower of Christ in the world that we live in. And the rest of the D's that we're going to look for we're going to look through and study, we'll have this as the foundation to be devoted to Jesus, to be dependent on him, is to walk in his direction, is to walk in. And that's the foundation of living a scattered Christian life. It is to walk in Christ's direction 
focusing on him and being guided by him, that is devoted to him and dependent on him. So what does this mean for us? Well, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then know today that you are his and being his matters, that he has summoned you to go and tell and to go and smell, okay? He equips you. He, as he's equipped these disciples, as we're going to see in the next couple of weeks, to scatter. We are equipped to scatter and how to follow him in this world by his direction. And so I want to leave you with a question and a thought this coming week. In thinking about Jesus summoning his disciples, are you listening? If he has summoned you, are you listening? Are you listening? Are you listening to his instruction? Have you listened to this passage? Do you hear his voice when he calls? And then do you respond? Listen, humility is required. Humility is required. Have you come when he has called you? Have you heard his instruction? Have you humbled your heart, seeing his wonderful mercy and grace on your life? That he loves us despite us and has called us to go into the world as, as falling short as we do. But then that would be the example of his wonderful grace then, wouldn't it? As he's come alongside us and said, follow me. Are you walking in his direction, devoted to him and dependent on the Holy Spirit? And it begins with that question. Are you listening.